All right, I want you to take God's word and turn with me this morning to Psalm 103. Psalm 103. In just a moment, we'll come to this text. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here, uh, the opportunity to speak to you this morning in chapel. And we're going to look at God's word together in just a moment. But I want to speak to you from my heart for just a moment. God called me to preach at the age of 10. And uh, I was extremely blessed. Looking back, I understand that better now. I had 180 plus meetings a year from the age of 10 uh, till probably the age 19. And I didn't have the opportunity that many of you have to come to college. And I tried starting college but didn't get through uh, college. I had dropped out the first year. Uh, because there was a conflict with preaching meetings and continuing school. Sometimes I wished I'd have continued school, but I think oftentimes that God had given me things that many people had uh, worked toward and went to school to learn, and it seemed like things got reversed for me. And so I have tried to pursue my education. Hopefully very soon I can be a part of this student body and kind of sit where you sat and expand what God has given me. And I thank the Lord for the opportunity to be a part of today. This place is a special place in my heart. And I love Dr. Sexton. I love all of the staff folks here. And thank the Lord for the ministry that goes on here day to day. But I took a lot of things for granted. Uh, God had blessed me tremendously, given me all of those meetings in my early years. I squandered a lot of great opportunities. Have you ever bombed at something? There were some great opportunities I bombed at. I mean, I took some of the most wonderful opportunities and the greatest platforms and just blew it. And I knew why the phone didn't ring again from some people because I just blundered the opportunity. Uh, now that I'm a little older, I realize the importance of taking full advantage of the opportunities God has given me. And I want to encourage you, you'll regret it if you blunder the opportunities you've been given now. And you'll look back and wish you could do those things over. So what God has given you now, take full advantage of it, use it for His honor and glory, and do all you can and be all you can for Christ, and you'll be glad you did. We all have disappointments, don't we? We pray that God will help us to overcome those things. I want you to know that God has blessed my life because of your pastor. My life and ministry is what it is because of the influence of your pastor. Decisions that some men sweat over because of his influence, God has helped me to be able to have a handle on some things that without your pastor's influence, I would have never known how to deal with it. And I greatly appreciate his influence and wisdom. I want you to look with me in Psalm 103. Let's look at it. We're going to look at six verses together this morning. Psalm 103, verse number 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of His benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness, and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. Let's bow for prayer. Father, as we come to you in Jesus' name, we pray that you would take these few moments we have together and may they bring glory and honor to you. Dear Father, I pray that the heart of some student would be encouraged, some faculty member would be lifted up, that Jesus Christ would be magnified and glorified in this place this morning. And dear Father, I love this place. I found it to be a source of encouragement and strength in my life, and I know many others have found it to be the same for them. Lord, put a hedge of protection around it. Bless every staff and faculty member. Keep us from sin. Keep our eyes upon Jesus. And Lord, may our testimony bring glory and honor to you in this earth. 
And dear Father, for all that you do for us today, we'll be careful to give you the praise, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen and amen. There's a sad place in the book of Genesis, chapter 40, verse 23. It tells us a story about how Joseph interpreted the dream of the chief butler. When the chief butler's life is spared, then all of a sudden he gets back into the place where he is safe, he's out of prison, and the Bible tells us something about his relationship with Joseph. The Bible said that the chief butler forgot what Joseph had done for him. I don't know about you, but it's tough to be forgotten. For someone to treat you as though that you're nothing. To forget anything that you've done for them. And Joseph no doubt felt the pain of rejection and loneliness and being forgotten. Often we share in that pain. We know what it is to have done for others only to have them to forget us in return. We want to be remembered, don't we? We don't want to be forgotten. Oftentimes our God is put in that place by us. He becomes the forgotten God, the one who has been forgotten by us. He blesses us so much only for us to return in forgetting what he's done. During the Welsh revival, there was a hymn that was sung often. You and I know that hymn very well. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. If I were to hand you pen and paper this morning, and I were to ask you to write down all the blessings of God, that he has done for you in the last week, the last month, or the last year. Before long, a book would be compiled of all of God's blessings towards you in just a brief period of time. I think too often we forget about the daily provisions of our Lord and what he does for us on a moment by moment, a day by day, month by month basis, we have been blessed beyond measure. When you look at Psalm 103, the psalmist is thinking about how much God has blessed him. And I want you to look at it with me in just a moment as we look at it together. Charles Spurgeon rightly said it about Psalm 103. As in the lofty Alps, some peaks rise above all others. Among even the inspired psalms are the heights of song which overtop the rest. He said this 103rd psalm has ever seemed to us like the Monte Rosa of the divine chain of the mountains of praise, glowing with a ruddier light than any of the rest. You see, in Psalm 103, it stands above the rest because there's no petition or request that is given. From the very first word to the last word of this chapter, only meditations upon our praise toward God and blessing His holy name. When you open this chapter, the first six verses deal with the matter of personal praise. That's how you and I should offer our praise to God. The next 12 verses deals with national praise, and then the remaining verses deal with universal praise. The Bible tells us in Psalm 150, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. That's a scriptural right to bless his name. We all are breathing. We all are healthy. We all are well in this assembly this morning. We have every reason to praise the Lord. The Bible outlines in verse number one the reasons for our praise. Look at verse one with me. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. I grew up in a church where my pastor at the end of every service would have the whole congregation stand and lift their hands toward heaven. We would recite this verse together at the end of every service. I miss that. Oftentimes I recollect that and I will call attention our church at the end of every service and we'll quote that verse together. There's strength drawn from that verse. It's a reminder of the reason that we pray. Rejoicing ought to be a common characteristic of every believer. It should be an indelible part of your life this morning. 
You see, praise is important because of its divine focus. There's an outline in verse number one of who we should bless is none other than the Lord. And so the divine focus of our praise should be upon the God of heaven and the Lord who has saved us and redeemed us. Praise should be divinely focused. Bless the Lord. We bless a lot of other things. We give credit to where credit's due. We elevate man and humanity. The Bible said we should bless the Lord. The idea is that when we bless the Lord and praise his holy name, that we are bringing pleasure and delight to the Lord. Warren Wearsby writes it like this. He said parents are pleased when children simply thank them and love them and expect nothing in return. Well, I want to say simply that our God expects the same from us. Although he gives us and blesses us and, and supplies for us, you and I should give him thanks expecting nothing in return. The psalmist is concerned not only by what is seen by others, but what we say to the Lord. I think oftentimes praise becomes very superficial. Sometimes we do it in front of others to impress them. But here in this text, the psalmist is saying, we bless the Lord. We do it from our heart. It is what we say to the Lord that matters, not what is seen by others. He is focused on what God feels, not what we feel. Now, I grew up in a very emotional environment, camp meeting environment, and I love that environment. But it's, it's easy to get swept along with all of the feelings and emotions and not get anchored in faith and truth of God's word. It's easy to believe what somebody tells you is the Bible instead of searching the scripture and knowing the Bible yourself. And here the psalmist says, when we bless the Lord, this is about personal experience, a relationship with God Almighty. This is not a matter of emotions this is a matter of decision and intention to praise the Lord. It should be divinely focused. We're not praising the music. We're not praising the preacher. We're not praising all of the accomplishments of man. When we praise and bless the Lord, it is all divinely focused upon him. You ever heard anybody say, I didn't get anything out of the service today? The real question that arises is what did you give in the service? People are looking for something without giving nothing in return. Now I believe that it's important to go to church expecting something. I've seen people put on their Facebook posts, I can't wait to see what the Lord's going to do. Well, what are you going to do? You see, people are looking for the Lord to do something miraculous and almighty, but he uses you and I to do it. He wants us to be a part of the process. And church is more than just what we get from God, but it's what we give to God. Think about it for a moment. The ultimate purpose in going to the house of God is so that we can praise God for all that he's done for us in that past week. And those frequent visits to church are opportunities for us to engage and give ourselves in worship, to give our tithes and offerings, to give ourselves up totally and wholly to God in praise for what he has done for us in the past week. The focus of our praise must be the Lord. And the purpose of our praise must be to bless the heart of the Lord. Praise should be divinely focused. It should be deeply felt. The psalmist said, bless the Lord, O my soul. All that is within me, he said, bless his holy name. Do you feel something that rises up in you? Do you feel an emotion inside of you that compels you to the feet of Jesus, that offers you up to God in your worship time? Praise should be deeply felt. And when David talks about it, he is calling on his soul to rise up within him and bless the Lord. 
Spurgeon said many of our faculties, emotions and capacities God has given to us. And we should use them all to glorify Him. He said they ought to all join in chorus and praise. He said half-hearted, ill-conceived, unintelligent praises are not such we should render to our loving Lord. If you're going to come to church with half-hearted praise, leave it at home. God deserves our very best and he deserves our blessing and praise toward all that he's done for us. I would ask you this morning, does God want it all? Does he want every part of you? Well, listen to what the psalmist said in Psalm 63, verse number three. But thy loving kindness is better than life, and my lips shall praise thee. The psalmist said, I'm going to praise you with my lips. Listen to the extension of that. Psalm 145, verse 21. My mouth shall speak of the praise of the Lord. Now it moves from the lips to the mouth. Here's another verse. Psalm 47, verse number one. Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. Now the hands are a part of the praise. If that's not enough, Psalm 63, verse number four said, Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. Now it's went from the lips to the mouth to the hands clapping and to the hands uplifted. And the Bible teaches us to lift up holy hands in worshiping and praising his holy name. Oh, dear friend, God has given us every reason for praise. Secondly, he gives us a remembrance of our purpose. Look at verse number two. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And if you were to take one phrase in all of this chapter that stands above all of the rest, here's what it is. Forget not all of his benefits. That's really what I want to speak to you today is never forgetting to remember. Never forget to remember. He simply says that when we know the Lord, we've experienced his blessings, we do it with all of our soul, then we will not be forgetful of what he's done for us. The psalmist calls our soul to bless the Lord. The word forget that the psalmist is using is the idea of memory that has been lost. Or a period of time that has softened the memory of the subject matter. If you and I are not careful, as close as we are to God at this moment, We can slip slowly away from the Lord in a Christian college, Christian school environment, in a church environment, in the most healthy Christian environments, people slip away from God. The greatest preaching, the greatest singing, the greatest encouragement, friendships and relationships that nurture our Christian faith and we can still get indifferent toward God. And all I'm simply saying to you, we must remember our purpose. We must never forget to remember. Why do we forget to remember? Donald Gray Barnhouse said this. He said the vast majority of mankind never gives a thought of gratitude toward God for all of his care and blessing. The vast majority. Now look, that indicts all of us in this room for the most part. We're not as grateful as we ought to be. I include myself. Another has said, thankless men are like swine feeding on acorns. They lay under the tree as the acorns fall upon their heads, but they they never look up to see from whence those acorns come. Another writer said it like this, I fear what will surprise us most is one day when we stand before God, it will be the extent of our own ingratitude And I think oftentimes we think we're grateful. We think we're giving God praise. We think that we're blessing his name. But there is so much absence of praise in our life and gratitude. We ask more than we bless his name. We want more than we bless his name. We want God to respond to us more than we want to respond to him. And we are to remember to never forget. 
Maurice Roberts said, it must make the devils themselves marvel to see us able to receive pardon and a title to everlasting joy with scarcely a few cold syllables of the gratitude of God in our heart. How does heaven view our ingratitude? What does the devil's Look on our lives and see concerning our love and our relationship and our gratitude to God. Why do we forget to remember? The words of William Steele, it is sad when there is nothing for which we have been grateful to God. It is serious when there is something and we fail to show gratitude. It is tragic when we are busy asking for more that we forget to thank Him for what we've received. You see, if you understand the word thank, you understand it derives from the word think. And a thankful man will be a thinking man. And a man whose mind is upon God is a man who will always be thankful to the Lord. The cause of our forgetting God is simply this. It's due to being unthankful in the heart and unthankful in the mind. You see, we're just not set upon Christ as we should be. That's why we forget to remember. The second thing I want you to consider is a suggestion. How do we remember to never forget? Well, Charles Spurgeon's hint to the village preacher, he said this about Psalm 103 verse 2. He said, inquire into the causes of our frequent forgetfulness of the Lord's mercies and show the evil of it and advise remedies. Now here is the remedy in Psalm 103 verse number 2. Forget not all of his benefits. Do you want to dispel the evil, the sin, the ungodliness in your life? Forget not all of his benefits. We must remember to never forget what has been done on our part. Oh, God has been good, hasn't he? Moses was telling the people of Israel, don't forget him, don't forget your God, don't forget what he's done, and listen to what he said to them in Deuteronomy 7, 18. Thou shalt not be afraid of them, but thou shalt remember well, well remember what the Lord thy God did unto Pharaoh and all of Egypt. Deuteronomy 8, verse number 2. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee 40 years in the wilderness. Don't forget it. Always remember it. Deuteronomy 15, verse 15. Thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee. Therefore I command thee this thing, this day. Don't forget it. Always remember to never forget is what Moses is saying. And the psalmist singles something out particularly. He talks about the benefits. What are we not to forget? All of the benefits, all of the blessings. One writer calls them a bundle of blessings. So let's look at these bundle of blessings in two different facets. Number one, let's recall the past of his benefits. I like what the scripture says. Look at it with me. Verse 3. Who forgiveth all of thine iniquities. How many of your iniquities? All of them. Who healeth how many of your diseases? All of your diseases. You know why you should give your all to him? He gives his all to you. That's simple, isn't it? He deserves your best. He deserves your all. We recall the past. We recall this bundle of benefits. And the first one we look at is this. Who forgiveth all of thine iniquities. He is the Lord who has power over sin. He forgives. No matter what you've done, where you've been. No matter what type of sinner comes to Jesus. Doesn't matter where he grew up, where he came from, who his mother and daddy was. He needs Jesus. And there's enough grace to save him. Enough blood to wash his sin away. Enough power to save him from the gutter of sin unto the uttermost. 
And I'm simply saying to you this morning, when we recall our past and what Jesus has done for us, the Lord has had power over our past sin. He has power over our present sin. As far as you look ahead, he's got it covered. The Lord who forgiveth our sin. I like what Tozer said. He said, I believe that the uh, chronic unhappiness of most Christians may be attributed to the gnawing uneasiness that they have forgotten that they were forgiven of all of their sins. The psalmist said, he forgave you of all of them. I like the Greek, Greek interpretation for all. It's all. I like Tennessee hillbilly interpretation for all. All. Even from where I'm from in Georgia, all means all. Every sin, and he had power over every sin. And Satan, the accuser of the brethren, he'll come whisper in my ear occasionally, do you remember what you've done? Do you remember where you were when this happened? And the shame seems to flood my soul and mind and the guilt hung over my head as though I can never overcome it, but I take it the Lord in prayer and the Lord says something like this. What sin are you talking about? I don't remember it anymore. The book of life, it's been torn out. I don't remember it. He has power over sin. Why do I ever try? Why do you ever try to remember something that God has already forgotten? He has power over sin. He forgiven. Look at the second phrase in verse three. Who healeth all thy diseases. He has power over sickness. He heals. Verse number three. He healeth all of our diseases. Spurgeon said, many cited is the character of our heavenly father for having forgiven us as judge he then cures us as physician. I'm not saying that those who serve God will never suffer with sickness. But I know that sickness and sin are closely related in Scripture. I simply know this about the matter of our soul's healing, that God knows how to heal the soul completely, even if the body suffers. He healeth, and when he saved me, he began the process of healing me. This is a promise to every believer. Even if the body perishes, the soul will prosper. Psalm 41 verse number four, Lord be merciful unto me. Heal my soul for I have sinned against thee. There's not only power to save, but power over the sickness that holds you back. It's the matter of the soul. The Lord has power over sin, power over sickness. He has power to save. Look at verse number four. Who does what? Redeemeth. Redeemeth. He redeems our life from destruction. Warren Wiersbe said this statement describes someone who is almost about to fall in the pit. Some, some read Psalm 40 and say, I was in the pit sinking down for the last time. Here's an analogy of one standing at the edge of the pit, getting ready to fall. And just about at the moment where he loses control, when he's completely helpless, the Savior's hand reaches out to him and pulls him to safety, delivers him and saves him. He has power to redeem. When you've lost your footing, he has power to redeem. He has power to save. The recalling of the past. And then let's look at the second portion of these benefits. The recounting of the present. The Lord who blesses the undeserving is outlined. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. The psalmist says in verse number four, in essence, God shows acts of kindness with his loving kindness. He adds his compassion to that. The loving kindness is how God acts toward us. But his tender mercies is the way he shows how compassionate he is in our lives. He crowns us. Men and women who do not deserve a crown. 
Men and women who do not deserve honor. Men and women who deserve the lowest place of life. They're undeserving and God crowns them. His crown upon you and I is not a matter of merit. We didn't deserve it. But it's a matter of mercy. And upon our head we wear his blessing. We identify with his grace. And if someone wants to know why our accountants is so different and why we are changed from darkness to light and what the difference of the believer and the unbeliever is, it is the fact that we wear his crown. He crowns us with blessing and glory that's undeserved. The Lord blesses the undeserving. Secondly, he blesses the underdog. I like this. I've always been the weakling. Always was the one hiding behind mother. When God called me to preach at the age of 10, a lot of folks laughed about it. I stand today with the same fear that I had as a 10-year-old boy when I stood behind the pulpit, scared to death. I hope it'll help some of you to know that you don't have to have complete confidence, just total reliance upon the Lord. And all I'm simply saying to you is I've felt like the underdog. I've been in preacher's meetings and I've been made to feel as though I was the lowest in the room. I've been in a public school environment where I was made to feel the lowest of the class. I've been in environments where I felt like when asked to speak or say something that everything I had to say was in total opposition to everything that was going on. But you know what? God has blessed this underdog. God has been good to me. And God has brought my life from the ashes and the ruins and the disappointments. And recently in the last year, I suffered something in my life that I thought I could not recover from. I thought that confidence in me was lost and that I had failed miserably. Only when the Lord reminded me that he's the one that puts the approval upon our lives, not others. And it doesn't matter if you're the last one in the class, struggling with your grades, struggling being at school, this your first year and you're questioning everything. Hang on, hang on. God blesses those that are struggling. You see, our God is attracted to weakness. He loves those who will recognize their helplessness and rely upon him for total dependence. They asked me to be the chaplain of the local football team. That's been exciting. But standing on the sidelines every Friday night has been disappointing. We've lost every single game. Last weekend, I felt like if I had not done something, half the team was going to walk off the field. And I was going to young men and saying, look, if you throw your pads on the sideline in your jersey and walk off this field, it says something about your character. That night I had to help the coach get off the field because the parents were on his back. I thought, what in the world am I doing in this mess? The boys asked me that night, why do you even hang around with us? I said, because even if you lose every game, I've found a love in my heart for you guys. Though somebody would call you losers, I think you wanted something. Staying on the field, finishing the game, till the time runs out, the buzzer goes off, you're going to be faithful to the end. This year is shaping your life and molding your life. It just doesn't take anybody to lose every game. You guys are trying every game even though you're losing. You get out with more tenacity than you had the year before. And you'll walk off of this field. And if you lose every game this year, you'll walk off of this field with something inside of you that will last all of your life. And I said to them, I was an underdog. I was a sinner 
I was lost and without God and Satan whispering in my ear how worthless I was and I felt as though I could not do anything or accomplish anything but God in his love and mercy died for me and saved me and forgive me my sin and I learned something through my struggle that brought me to the feet of Jesus. That's good preaching in a high school, isn't it? All I'm saying is God loves the underdog. He's attracted to weakness. He loves you this morning. I think we need to be reminded of it. I think we need to admit our helplessness. He blesses the underdog. And then thirdly, he blesses the undefended. Look at verse number six. The Lord executeth what? Righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. The hardest thing you're ever going to have to learn, something that even a lot of pastors haven't learned, a lot of Christian servants have not learned is the fact that God is the one who fights our battles for us. They said something on Facebook. So what? They're lighting Twitter up on me. Great. They're criticizing a decision I made. Look, if you don't get used to it and accept that people are going to say things about you, folks are going to side against you, people are going to malign and manipulate you, but this thing is about you and the Lord. It's never been about you and everybody else. And we love the accolades of men and the praise of men. But this is about blessing the Lord and giving praise to Him. The problem is we love the praise instead of giving the praise to the one who rightfully deserves it. And when we lose that, we either feel empty or we replace it with a praise that will content the soul and that is praise and blessing toward God. Let me quote Spurgeon one more time. Mercy to his saints demands vigilance upon his persecutors, their persecutors, and he will repay it. No blood of martyrs shall be shed in vain. No groan of confessors in prison shall be left without inquisition being made concerning them. All wrongs shall be righted. The oppressed shall be avenged. Justice at times may lead the courts of men, but it abides upon the tribunal of God. Someone said of someone who was guilty as charged that got loose on a technicality in a courtroom of law, said they got away with it. But they didn't get away with it. God knows about it. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And all I'm simply saying is we can bless the Lord because he defends us when we take matters off of our table and put them on his. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God has done. John Philip said, anytime we have trouble praising the Lord, we should turn to this psalm get down before the Lord and recite it back to him. He said all of a sudden this poem and pay on of perfect praise will be offered up in his presence and all will be well again. You just praise God through trouble and the trouble seems to disappear in time. I think of the story about an old black deacon in a church. He was all time shouting. The old preacher that pastored the church was fine because he liked a little shouting himself. But he died, and a more educated, more formal young man come in to pastor the church. The old deacon still continued to do what he did when the previous pastor was there, but that new preacher didn't like all of this carrying on. He'd get to preaching, and that old black deacon would say, Hey man, preacher, hallelujah. Preach on. It bothered him. He talked to a couple of the other deacons, said, will you go talk to him? Would you speak to him about this matter of him interrupting the service? It's not very respectful. They went down to the place where he was plowing that day and those men said, uh, how's the weather, how's the crop, how's the fields? But then they get down to the purpose for which they come to talk to him. And they say, now, 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 brother, we, we likes you. 
relax, you shout. But now, now our new preacher, people want to hear him. And he'd feel a whole lot better if you just kind of calm down a little bit. He says, I know what you all are talking about. He said, I've told myself times and times again I was going to quit it. But he said, I start thinking about how Jesus saved this old black sinner. Forgive his sin and washed him in the blood of Jesus. And every time I get down and say I'm not going to do it again, it just rises up in me. He said, I start doing it all over and all over again. I'm telling you this morning when it gets low and I get down and I feel like I can't do anything again, I get to thinking about his grace and his mercy and his love and I want to bless his name and praise his name. It wells up like an overflowing fountain and starts bursting forth in my soul and I'm here to tell you this morning, I love him and I bless his name and I hope you do as well.